Great. Hello. Um, are there any questions about the, the writing assignments? I, I discussed that last time. One thing I wrote down here, I hope this is clear. I guess in some year or other it was not, or else I wouldn't have written it down here. That you're supposed to choose one passage. <laughs> Yes, someone maybe thought that you were supposed to write about all of them. <laughs> yeah. For our write up, uh, the passage by the people on that third interview, it says uh, that, like, I, I, I do this because I think, but they, he, didn't, he doesn't define thought in that passage. Are we able to go to other parts of the reading to try and redefine thought exactly? You, you said not to try and summarize the best thing to the write up. Right. Well, I mean, I had trouble because with thought, if it's awareness of thought or the process of thought emerging, that's why I kind of was a little spooked out by like the, the, the kind of definition of thought. I'm pretty sure it's awareness of thought because it's like I think there, boy, I'm aware that I'm thinking. Well, um, I'm, well, I'm going to talk about what it is today, but um, but yeah, I guess it depends on your objection. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, can you might, I guess, have to mention something else that's somewhere else in the text. What what I was saying is that you shouldn't summarize, right? Like it shouldn't be like first Descartes says this, and then he says this, and then he says this, and then that's what it is passages, and then he says this, and right, like that's you know. But if your if your objection is like, now as we can tell from here, what he means by thought is X, but you know, okay, that, I don't know, would be fine. Yeah, and we can just write to you. We don't have to be like. You know, you don't have to like you're the reader we can like infer that you yeah well, your ta is actually the reader but oh, yeah right. you can assume that yeah yeah you can assume that that your uh reader is you know is familiar with dick right <laughs> yes all right um okay um yeah and i so i have I have to first of all apologize that um, I didn't remember myself exactly what the reading assignment was today when I was talking about it last time. It actually goes farther than I than I thought. <laughs> I hope that didn't screw anyone up. It doesn't stop right after the cogito. Um, well, I mean, I guess the only way it might screw you up is that I'm going to talk about the other part, and maybe if you haven't read it, you won't know what I'm talking about. But um, The, you know, the correct assignment is on the syllabus. I was just saying it from memory when I said it slightly wrong. All right, anyway, um, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is, yes, I should say just at least a little bit about the dreaming argument. That's the one thing in the first meditation that I didn't get to at all last time that I feel like something needs to be said about. Um, um, because so, uh, right when it, so what I call the doubting voice and the responding voice have a couple of rounds in the, in the sense experience part, right? So first the doubting voice says, well, the senses have sometimes deceived me. And it's prudent never to trust completely those who have deceived us even once. And then the next sentence is what I'm calling the responding voice. Yet, although the senses occasionally deceive us with respect to objects which are very small or in the distance, there may be, there are many other beliefs about which doubt is quite impossible, even though they are derived from the senses. Right, so the, the responding voice says, you know, Okay, true, it's prudent never to trust someone who has deceived you even once, but I mean, you may need to distinguish between like um, 
the type of thing that they've deceived you about and other things that they've never deceived you about. So, you know, and the responding voice is saying, yeah, fine, when it's like a tower that's far away and I can't tell what shape it is. Yeah, sometimes the senses deceive me. But uh, how could I doubt that I'm now sitting by the fire holding this paper in my hand, et cetera? Um, and then... Um, So the translators put in again here to try to explain that the connection between this and the next thing, the responding voice says, how could it be denied that these hands or this whole body are mine? I, I think it's not so much again as um, um, and if you say maybe I could be wrong about things like that, Surely I can't be wrong, right? That that's like what's implicit between those those two things. Surely I couldn't be wrong about whether I have hands or a body. How could I be wrong about that? Now, uh, right? That is, what real reason do I have to doubt that? Because remember, it's not enough to say, "Oh, you might be wrong." <laughs> you have to show that one of your old beliefs gives you reason to doubt that. And the, so the doubting voice says. Well, unless perhaps I were to liken myself to madmen whose brains are so damaged by the persistent vapors of mel melancholia, they, they, by vapors from black bile, <laughs> it's like an explanation of insanity, that, are, that, they, that they firmly maintain that they are kings when they are paupers, or say they are dressed in purple when they are naked or that their heads are made of earthenware, or that they are pumpkins, or made of glass. So, okay, maybe there is a reason to doubt it, because some people are wrong about things like that. Right? Answer, but such people are insane. And I would be thought equally mad if I took anything from them as a model for myself. So there's actually there's a famous disagreement between or or you know argument between Foucault and Descartes about uh, sorry between Foucault and Derrida about what happens at this point in the first meditation. Um, Foucault you know takes this sentence as saying that uh, Descartes has like ruled out the insane, right? Has, like has ruled out the mad. Um, and said, well, I can't compare myself to them because I have reason and they don't have it or something like that, right? Um, and Derrida says, and actually, I don't think either of them are exactly right <laughs> here, but Derrida, I think, is closer to being right because uh, Derrida says, well, but look what happens in the next paragraph. You, have, you, you don't see what Descartes is doing with it, right? Because that was the responding voice. And, you know, so what the responding voice is saying is, like, um, it has a certain plausibility to it, right? That is, if I came in here and said, well, here's a table, maybe not, maybe I'm mad, right? <laughs> then you would be like, yeah, probably you are, right? Like, it's not normal to compare yourself to people who are, you know, under this kind of delusion. If you, uh, uh, it's it is, it's not one of your old beliefs that you're one of those. People. Um, so, uh, but the responding for, but the doubting voice comes back, a brilliant piece of reasoning, as if I were not a man who sleeps at night, and regularly has all the same experiences while asleep, as madmen do when awake. Indeed, sometimes even more improbable ones, right? So the, the way the dream initially comes in is as a response to the claim that it would be insane for me to think of myself as possibly insane. And the answer is, no, it's one of your old beliefs that you are insane sometimes, every night. <laughs> um, um, and of course, sometimes when you dream, 
your experiences are extravagant, like those of those madmen we were just describing. But sometimes your experience is that you're seated by the fire or holding a piece of paper or whatever. <laughs> so, um, um, so that is, you believe you think the type of thing you think now at a time when you agree that you're insane. Therefore, it is it's it's reasonable to compare yourself to those men. That's part of your old beliefs. <laughs> um, that's so. I mean, I don't know. Uh, there's definitely a lot more to be said about this. Um, also about like what the madmen are wrong about and what the dream what the dreamer is wrong about. Like a lot of it has to do with whether you're clothed or not. Right, like the, um, one of the things that the madmen think is that they dress in purple when they're actually naked. And, but uh, one of the things that Descartes says, when Descartes talks about the ordinary experiences he's, he's had in dreams, um, or when the meditator talks about the ordinary experiences, she, you, if you looked at the metaphysics exercise, you see that there I refer to the meditator as she, that's kind of like my, uh, related to my thought that the meditator is Francine. It's, I mean, it's not grammatically possible in the sense that the, the Latin forms in the text are masculine, not feminine, but you know, I mean, that's the default gender, right? I mean, which, I mean, not that that's somehow innocent, but that's the default gender, but, <laughs> but it is, right? So like, you can't necessarily tell from that. Anyway, the meditator, he or she, um, describes this experience. How often asleep at night, I am convinced of just such familiar events that I'm here in my dressing gown, sitting by the fire, when in fact I am lying undressed in bed. So it's going to come up later uh, in the later parts of the second meditation. This thing about being dressed or not is going to come up again. And I mean, I think uh, along the lines of what I was saying last time that that in a way the conclusion of the meditations will be that you were dreaming. <laughs> in a way, the conclusion of the meditations will be that you did think you were closed when you weren't. <laughs> um, okay, but in any case, so that's all I wanna say about the dreaming argument for now. Are there questions about that? Yeah. Well, the response to like uh, the, the doubting voice thing, like, you know, I guess they're, they're speaking from the perspective of like the same person, right? Or they yeah, that's why I said it's a fiction within a fiction, yeah. right? It's like yeah. the, the fictional narrator is con is conducting a fictional dialogue within themselves. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they they respond like essentially <laughs> to like the point, which is I know I have a body and I have hands, but have I ever been deceived on that? But I've been asleep and had like crazy dreams before or something, right? So, what was the response to that? Okay, well, I mean, so like you're, you're skipping over some of the structure as I as I outlined it, but yeah, no, uh, but. So, well, I mean, there is another response, even after the first appearance of the dreaming argument, the responding voice comes back and says, well, but I never have such distinct experiences in dreams. Um, um, to which the doubting voice says, well, as if I haven't been deceived by exactly such thoughts and dreams before, right? Like thought to myself, I can tell whether this is a dream. But it turned out I was wrong. So, um, and you know, there's different ways of understanding that. I, um, and and at that point, the sense experience part is over, right? Like at that point, the meditator says, "Okay, I have to distrust everything that came from my senses." So that's the end of that part. There's no response to that 
the response is to shift then is to shift ground to a rationalist foundation you know um so like one way of understanding that would be something like well when i'm dreaming you know i'm so confused that i can't make an argument properly you know so i mean it, if that's what it meant then then the sixth meditation would not really be satisfactory i think I feel like what Descartes means by it more is something like, um, um, I may have thought I had some criteria for telling whether it's a dream or not, but obviously those criteria were not sufficient because they, they led me astray. And in the sixth meditation, he's going to give the true criteria. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's an ancient Chinese philosopher, I think it was John Tse, who makes a fairly similar thought experiment about dreams and comes to a similar conclusion. Is there is it is it possible that Descartes or European intellectuals generally at this point had like any access to philosophical writings or any writings from China? So first of all, I've heard of I have heard of that. I I, I've never read it or anything, so I, I mean, I don't know anything about it, but I, is it possible? Um, yeah, it's possible. Uh, I mean, Leibniz actually was very interested in China. Yeah, well, a lot of German idealists were made. Yeah, I, I think that, um, uh, and during Locke's time at Oxford, there were people there working on Chinese uh, and and also uh, Arabic mathematics and stuff like that. Um, my feeling is that Descartes is a little bit early for that, but I, but but I'm not, you know, I'm no expert. I'm not sure, but I mean, but I guess uh, I'm not suggesting he like copy it. Just well, yeah, no. So I mean, I'm going to talk about the, something related when I talk about precedence for the cogito argument. That you know, I mean, uh, for sure, there's whether that's one or not. For sure, there's plenty of things in in Descartes' arguments where he has heard someone make a similar argument or has seen someone make a similar argument. Um, uh, it doesn't really come out of nowhere. <laughs> um, I, I think. Uh, um, on the other hand, uh, I don't think, and so, like I said, I haven't seen the Chinese example, but I would be very surprised if this weren't true in that case, too. Um, no one has put these arguments together in exactly the same way Descartes has before, right? And the exact way he puts them together is really important. <laughs> um, so, I mean, uh, uh, you shouldn't jump from thinking it comes from nowhere to thinking that he's somehow unoriginal or something. No, I'm not saying yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, it is possible, and it's interesting to you know, um, um, it's hard to pin down. Obviously, I guess you know you would have to ask whether the Jesuits, that yeah. when the Jesuits started translating Chinese stuff, and were the Jesuits at Descartes school connected to that. Talk about madness or anything like that. I don't think I don't think the Chinese had a concept of madness at that point. Really? I, I mean, that would be interesting really, if they didn't. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. Well, I. But I mean, there's a concept of madness in Homer and the Bible, and I mean, in the Bible they mostly think they're possessed by demons, don't they? <laughs> You're no. thinking of the New Testament. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah. Um, well, anyway, um, um, right. So, uh, yeah, it's possible. Um, and yeah, sometimes surprising things like that turn out to be true. Um, Okay, other questions? I guess, I, I mean, the, the, the thing, I, the reason I wanted to discuss the dreaming argument in a little bit of detail is just to show that it's not, you know. Um, I remember when I first taught this 
Did I already say this in this class? No, I don't think so. When I first taught this text, it was the University of Chicago, and I was like a, um, a fellow, and like they they had fellows, so they would have someone to teach the core sequence. So I was teaching this course called Philosophical Perspectives on the Humanities. <laughs> And it's like a small discussion course. So anyway, so I came in the first day we were after we read the first meditation. And I said, okay, so what's the first thing Descartes says? And someone is like, he says he might be dreaming. <laughs> like, oh no, that's not the first thing he says. <laughs> right? That's like the tenth thing he says. <laughs> Right. So it's like, in other words, the, it's not like the whole argument of the first meditation is, I might be dreaming, so I should doubt everything. The dreaming comes in in a very specific place to do a very specific job. Um, and it's able to do that, again, because it's part of my old beliefs that I'm sometimes dreaming. Um, um it's not part of my old beliefs that I'm always dreaming, but it turns, but it is part of my old beliefs that I'm sometimes wrong about whether I'm dreaming or not. <laughs> and that's enough to find a real reason for doubt. Okay. Um, all right. Are there more questions? Otherwise, I'll go on to the second minute. Okay. So Right, so there's this, as I already said, these words don't actually occur in the meditations, but right, there's this famous argument, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And I mean, like I said, these words are in the discourse. I think they're in the principles of philosophy. I think I signed a little bit of that for today, too. So and I, in other words, it's not like these are wrongly attributed to Descartes. On the other hand, I think it actually is important what in the, the official place of this argument in the second meditation, what precisely the meditator says, because it's not exactly this. But, um, um, but Okay, uh, you know, whether it's in this text or not, of course, like, if you know anything about Descartes, you know that he said that. <laughs> so, um, and there's, like, jokes based on it, right? So, like, you know, Descartes walks into a bar, and the bartender says, want a beer? And he says, I think not, and he disappears. <laughs> All right, so that's not that funny, but somewhat funny. But anyway, um, um, but funny or not, it involves a misunderstanding of his arguments. <laughs> so I want to call attention to that right away, because this doesn't mean I cause myself to exist by thinking. That is the force of this therefore, I'm not sure if therefore can ever mean this, but certainly here, therefore doesn't mean doesn't involve one thing causing another. I mean, like on the contrary, think about this example, like there's smoke, therefore there's fire. The smoke doesn't cause the fire. Fire causes the smoke, I guess, sort of. Anyway, say the fire causes the smoke. <laughs> um, so, um, the, the therefore isn't about one thing causing the other. The therefore is about inferring one thing from the other. Mm -hmm. Right? So at, at least roughly speaking, that's what's going on here. It's not that I'm saying that, that my thinking makes me exist. Um, I'm saying that if I'm thinking, I must exist. That is, I can infer from the fact that I'm thinking that I exist. <laughs> I guess it's probably relevant to say that 
because I've just gone back and forth, that cogito could be translated as I think or as I am thinking, right? There isn't, they don't have that um, aspect of distinction a lot. I think that's how it was translated in this translation of this course. As I am thinking? Okay, okay, well, that would, you know, that would be, that that would be a possible translation. Uh, and, and yeah, probably the right translation in context. But, um, but of course, there's no changing that the established <laughs> version. <laughs> it's always going to be, I think, therefore I am. Um, um, and uh, like, to emphasize that, that's that's why I, as part of the reading, I assigned principles of philosophy section 20, even though it's really about things, third meditation stuff that we haven't got to yet. But um, but the important thing actually is just the title of section 20. We did not make ourselves, but we're made by God. Right? So Descartes' conclusion on the contrary is going to be that he can't make himself exist by thinking. That's how the third meditation argument is going to work. Um, I guess I also, there's one other kind of misreading or, or misunderstanding of how this might work that, that sometimes crops up here, which is um, that this argument must he must think this argument works because he thinks he can make things true by thinking they're true. <laughs> right? So that, in other words, that, it, that you might understand it to mean, I think I am, therefore I am, or something like that. Um, but again, um, we already know Descartes doesn't think that, that he can make things true by thinking they're true. Right. On the contrary, he you know he says that there's only one truth about every matter, and if you think something else, you're wrong. <laughs> um, so um, so the the connection between the I think and I am is not um, it's specific to I am, right? Like I couldn't say I think there's a piece of chalk here, therefore there's a piece of chalk here. That doesn't follow. And we don't really, what is he thinking? He or she, what is the meditator thinking? Um, well, we have a, like, we'd have to look into the details of the argument to say that. But actually, um, um, at the point this inference is made, so to speak, at this point, the meditator is not thinking I am yet. They're thinking something else. Right, if they were already thinking I am, they wouldn't have to make the inference. <laughs> so they're so it's it's not I think I am, therefore I am. It's I think some, therefore I am. Okay. Are there questions so far? Yes. So then for the I think subconscious thought would fall under that too then. Because it's not that I, I am, it's just I think the subconscious goes off the subconscious all the subconscious. Well, okay, but if it's subconscious, you I mean, I guess you could make a subconscious argument, but you, <laughs> uh, if it's subconscious, you can't really use it for an art to make an argument because you're not conscious of it. Okay. So but, it's awareness of the conscious. Well, it's so I mean, so the truth is, uh, I don't think Descartes believes in subconscious thought. Right? Um, so, you know, Leibniz believes in subconscious thought, something you might call subconscious thought. I guess he calls it, he calls it unconscious thought or something like that. But, uh, um, but Descartes and Locke don't. Yeah. Uh, so in this, uh, I think therefore I am, is it like uh, the being or I am is something that's like a, a predicate of I think, and therefore it's like given within the 
the thinking, and it's just an extrapolation of that when he says that, or is it like, or is he, is it a conjecture that the I am, is it something that's like separate from the thing? I, it, it, the way I'm saying this is kind of confused, but. Um, um, it's confusing, <laughs> but I'm going to try to like unpack it in a way that makes some sense of it, and hopefully we'll answer that question. Yeah. I actually um, found the way that he explained this argument in the second meditation easier to understand than that statement. I mean, I think that statement makes sense, but with the context of what else we wrote, which was like, um, after he he assumes like, okay, assume I have no senses and no body and no, there's no sky and whatever. Um, does it now follow that I too do not exist? No, if I convinced myself of something, then I certainly existed. Right. Which I think is a much clearer way of making the same argument. Like if I am something that can be convinced, um, if I am something that can be de deceived by this demon that's thinking, giving me, um, you know, delusions of sense and stuff, um, then I have to, there has to be something there for him to deceive or for me to convince, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> that's that's the way the argument is supposed to work. Um, uh, and, but, uh, but, so, I mean, there's, to it come it happens twice in the second meditation you mentioned both of them right like a one sentence apart um the first one is no if i convinced myself of something then i certainly existed and the second one is in that case i too undoubtedly exist if he is deceiving me I actually think, so, I mean, sometimes the translators know better than I do. I, I realized that the, I was complaining about their translation of the subjunctive, the beginning of the first meditation. I realized they were actually right. Um, but, um, but nevertheless, go away, notifications. Jesus. Um. Yeah, as I thought. Without doubt, therefore, I also or further am. So I, I think they put the two in the wrong place. <laughs> um, that is, right, in that case, I too undoubtedly ex exist. That makes it sound like the argument is not only does a deceiver exist, but I also exist, mm -hmm. right? But I don't think that's the argument. I think the argument is, in that case, I, um, you, that is, undoubtedly then i also exist if he is deceiving me right like um uh that is existing is kind of the least you can do <laughs> so if someone's deceiving you then you at least exist <laughs> um i think that's the that's the way that the argument works in that iteration um, um, and that helps to show why, I mean, why can't you be deceived about this? You can't, uh, um, deceive yourself about it. Right, that's what I persuaded myself that, right, I persuaded myself is like, uh, the meditator didn't really persuade themselves that none of these things exist. The meditator 
deliberately turned their will in the opposite direction and deceived themselves and just resolved to pretend that none of these things exist. Um, and, and then as part of that, they then invented this deceptor, or I'm sorry, I'm saying it in Latin, but this deceiver, <laughs> right? So, um, um, uh, and, uh, but you can't deceive yourself about this and no one can deceive you about it, right? That is because no one can deceive someone who doesn't exist into thinking they exist. <laughs> That's the argument. Um, um, now, I think there's a bunch of like subsidiary notes and <laughs> whatever to make about it, but are there questions about the basic argument before I? Yeah. Not only did Buddhism, it's like it made millions of people across the world believe that there's no ego, no I, no self. Well, they, they may uh, make it sound kind of sinister, but you know, no, I mean, <laughs> uh, well, um, I don't know. I'm I'm not in uh, I'm not really in a position to say. Uh, how would Descartes res respond to Buddhism and vice versa? <laughs> so, um, but um, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm, I mean, I don't know exactly what, and I, I think probably if I were to look into it, I would find that it, it's not clear what it means at all, and that there's thousands of years of interpretation of it, right? Like what that doctrine of anatman or whatever actually means, you know? And and then once you determine that, you would try to see whether it, like whether Descartes could be seen as trying to refute it or whether they're really um, not talking about the same issue. I Yeah, that's all I can say to that. I mean, in other words, it's a good question, but it's too hard for me. <laughs> Other questions? All right. Um, so like one note I want to make is about the precedence for this argument. And I'm not going to go into detail, but it's this the argument is not absolutely original with Descartes. There's, I mean, there's well, there's probably more precedence, but there's two important precedents because they're both people that Descartes is known to um have been something of a follower of or been interested in. So one is Avicenna, um, and the other is um, Augustine or Augustine. Once read a long like argument between people about which way it should be pronounced, and the conclusion was inconclusive. <laughs> Augustine or Augustine. Anyway, um, so uh, the 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 use in uh, Augustine is um, is sim is most similar, like to the immediate conclusion here, because it's that you know it's saying, well, you um, it's in a dialogue, and someone is proving to the other some person that they know something, because at least they know that they exist. So that's that's like similar to the exact context. I think that um, in the broader picture, the av argument in Avicenna is like, displays more of what Descartes is trying to do with this, although it doesn't have that exact feature. So, because the argument in Avicenna, it's known as the floating man argument. <laughs> floating man. And, you know, in Avicenna, it's like the point is not to prove that you know something or that you exist, but to prove the distinction between the soul and the body, which, as we know, is one of Descartes' goals in the meditations. 
right? And so Avicenna asks you to imagine that uh, a human being is being carried along in the air, like in complete darkness and silence. Um, and the air is a medium temperature, so they don't feel any heat or cold. Um, and says, you know, in that situation, they wouldn't know they had a body, but they would still know they had a mind. Right. So that's um, like, and so like Avicenna, I mean, Augustine doesn't try to do that with it, whereas that's what Avicenna is trying, that's what Descartes is trying to do with the fact that this is the foundation. Did you have a question or you were just like, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, have you heard of sensory deprivation tanks? I yeah, I've heard of that. Would have loved them because they you literally can't tell that you have a body because it's like saline water that you float on that's body temperature. So you can do that now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, right, which I mean, like obviously, people could imagine doing it before they built the sensory deprivation tank, that's why they built that, right? So, yeah. so Avicenna could imagine it too, I guess. Um, I don't know if it's really true that you wouldn't, I mean, um, in like this is this is true in like the 80s, the CIA did pretty extensive like experiments with sensory deprivation. And this is also the principle on which what's called white room torture works. Mm -hmm. And it like permanently fucks your brain. So okay. I don't know that <laughs> Descartes' cargo totally works because yeah, you can think, but without embodiment, the stuff you are able to think um, does become truncated and that has very lasting effects. Right, well, okay. So don't necessarily think Descartes doesn't know that. Um, right. Um, I mean, we'll see at the end his talk about imagination having an organ and the brain, or whatever. I, yeah, but, um, um, okay, so I mean, I think like, um, both of those arguments are, you know, are suggestive. Uh, they're, you know, they contain pieces of what Descartes is doing here. As I said, I think it's, you know, Descartes was the one who, to put them together in this way. <laughs> um, but, um, but I would, I guess it's almost certain that he knew about both of those. So um, again, it's not something that came out of nowhere. Um, um, okay, so the next thing I want to do is, is go through more of the context in a little bit more detail, because this isn't actually the beginning of the second meditation, right? It doesn't start. I think therefore I am. So it starts first by remembering, you know, what I was doing last night. Um, um, getting to the point again of saying, Wow, I've really thrown doubt on, it seems like all my own beliefs. What remains true? Perhaps just the one fact that nothing is certain. So, um, right, so if we stopped there, we would have some kind of skepticism. Yeah. At the initial stage of his skepticism, did he also put God in that? Or when he said that he believed in God, was it more like a hypothetical belief in God? You know, uh, like I said, he he dances carefully around having the meditator actually say that they're doubting the existence of God. Um, but remember the passage I read from the beginning of the third meditation, where he said, uh, the meditator says, um, um, Uh, 
not the very beginning, but uh, and since I have no cause to think that there is a deceiving God, and I do not yet even know for sure whether there is a God at all, right? So uh, that that seems like the smoking gun. <laughs> Um, that that is included, but on the other hand, you can you can definitely understand why. I mean, it's I think actually it's it's not quite as clear, but it's fairly clear in the continuation of the second meditation also, right? Because the continuation, so the first step away from that skeptical conclusion is, Yet apart from everything I have just listed, how do I know that there is not something else which does not allow even the slightest occasion for doubt? And the first suggestion is, oh, maybe it's the existence of God. Right? So like now, I guess the, the doubting voice and the responding voice are still here, right? But now the responding voice is going to win. <laughs> the doubting voice is going to have to give up in that. Hey, so this, the so the first like the first move in the responding voices, uh, eventually victorious strategy is to suggest, oh, maybe the existence of God hasn't been called into doubt. Um, is there not a God or whatever I may call him who puts into me the thoughts I am now having? Now, I mean. It's going to turn out in the third meditation that uh, the, the proof of the existence of God in the third meditation is precisely going to be that there are certain thoughts that are in me that I couldn't have put in myself. Um, so, like, so this suggestion is one that Descartes ultimately thinks is right, but at this point, it, there's no proof for it. Right. So that's so it's at this point, this is also in doubt. And so the doubting voice says, but why do I think this since I myself may perhaps be the author of these thoughts? Um, so like the idea that I that I may have caused my own thinking actually um although it's not this argument it comes up as a reason for doubt that this argument has to answer <laughs> right like um it's uh i thought maybe i could conclude that something exists because something must have caused these thoughts in me but maybe i caused them myself so maybe that conclusion is is bad Aha, you say. So in that case, right, this is the responding voice. In that case, am I am not I at least something? Now, I mean, the answer is yes, right? <laughs> but we haven't quite got to that point yet. There's we still have to go through like one more thing before the responding voice can win. Um, because the doubting voice comes back and says, but I have just said that I have no senses and no body. This is the sticking point. Maybe that's what it means. I don't know. This is the sticking point. What follows from this? What is this is the sticking point? In Latin, it says basically says, I am stuck. <laughs> it doesn't say this is the sticking point. I don't know. Anyway, this is the sticking point. What follows from this? Or what follows from this? Am I not so bound up with a body and with senses that... It should say... Am I so bound up with a body and with senses that I cannot exist without them? Right? That is, this is the sticking point. What follows from this? Right? So that, that is the doubting voices has said, 
What do you mean you, you, you at least are something? You just proved that you don't have no body and no senses, so you don't exist. The responding voice says, um, but what follows from that? Am I so bound up with a body and with senses that I cannot exist without them? Right? So like that is the, the responding voice is saying, um, yeah, you're right. I, I, you know, um, I just said that I have no body, but does it, what follows from that? Does it follow from that, that I don't exist? Not clear, right? But then the doubting voice has one last try. But I have convinced myself that there is absolutely nothing in the world. No sky, no earth, no minds, no bodies. Now, so by the way, notice that this is one place in the meditations where the meditator does mention other minds. Seems like we've somehow we've we've proved that they don't exist, but or we've we found a reason to doubt them, but it's not, it wasn't explicit. Anyway, so I've just convinced myself there is absolutely nothing in the world. No sky, no earth, no minds, no bodies. Does it now, this is where the not should be. Does it not now follow that I too do not exist? And this is, and then this is where the actual cogito argument, the first version of it comes. No, if I convinced myself of something, then I certainly existed. Right? So the argument is that um, even if all these thoughts are not caused by any objects and they're all just my own invention, um, that still shows that I exist. <laughs> Um, uh, and then I guess this is really the last gasp of the doubting voice and the question is why is it doubled I'm going to try to say something about that but why is it doubled but anyway it is doubled right the doubting voice is one last try but there is deceiver of supreme power and cunning who is deliberately and constantly deceiving me in that case, and as I, as I said before, I want to translate that as this as, in that case, um, I undoubtedly also exist if he is deceiving me. And let me, him deceive me as much as he can. He will never bring it about that I am nothing so long as I think that I am something. Right, again, the... the he will never bring it about that I am nothing so long as I think that I am something because he can't bring it about that I do anything if I'm nothing. That particular phrasing seems to me kind of susceptible to the causality misreading. He does say, I think that I am something, right? So I guess he isn't saying, I think I am, therefore I am. But I feel like that passage can easily be misread that it way. could be misread that way which is why i was just i was just giving a different interpretation of it which i think is the right one that right the right. reason he it's it's not because thinking that i am something has the power to make me exist or something like that it's it, it's because um if i don't exist he can't make me think anything right the deceiver can't make me think anything if i don't exist Um, um, where was I going to talk about? I don't remember where I was going to talk about it, but I'm going to talk about it now <laughs> and probably regret it later. But um, that uh, um,
So the fact that the argument works that way has a, a bearing on a certain, like what might seem like a possible um, counterexample or objection to the argument. So you could say something like, um, well, maybe I don't really exist. Maybe I'm just a figment of someone else's imagination. Or maybe I'm just a uh, uh, you know, program in a computer. But, you know, so you have two alternatives. Either a program in a computer is something that can think it exists, right? Or a figment of imagination is something that can think it exists. And in that case, it's right. <laughs> or it's something that can't think it exists. And in that case, it's not deceived. <laughs> right? It can't make this argument at all. So like another way to put that is that at this point, and that's going to be the big problem in the, you know, in the upcoming part, at this point, um, weirdly, I've shown that I exist without apparently showing almost anything about what I am. What, what exists? Um, this doesn't show that my body exists. Right. It doesn't show that I can exist separately on the other. It doesn't exist show that I can exist separately of other things. Right. It doesn't show that I might but cease to exist if someone turned off the computer. Or if the red queen or is the white queen. Red queen. If the red queen woke up, maybe I would cease to exist. Right. I haven't shown that's not true. Um, all we know about the thing that exists is basically that it carried out this argument. <laughs> That's all we know about it. Um, now, um, so, so I mean, so so that's actually going to be the clue that Descartes tries to use in the following part of the second meditation to figure out what the, the meditator tries to use to figure out what they are. <laughs> um, but um, um, but before I get to that, I just want to say a few more things about the cogito argument itself. So one thing is to point out the, the presence of the past tense and the future tense in the two versions of the argument, right? That is, so um, right here in this like summarized form, we have the present tense, I am. But in the, in the form that it's actually worked out here in the second meditation, in the first version, we have this past, past tense, no, if I convinced myself of something, then I certainly existed. Right? So, um, um, remember, I said before, what is the meditator, what was the meditator thinking? Well, now we know, at least in this first part, they were thinking there is no uh, um, world, there are no bodies, there are no minds, whatever, right? Or they were they were persuading themselves of that. That was their thoughts. And now they're moving on to think something else. I am. But actually, that's not exactly what follows, right? What follows is that they were when they were thinking this thought. Um, and the other part, I mean, the, here it's less clear that this is essential, but but it it does happen. I feel like it's not an accident. 
But the second one, let him deceive me as much as he can. He will never bring it about that I am nothing. Right? It's the that's a future tense. So um, so there is a so I mean um, first of all, there's a potential problem for the argument. I mean, it's a weird problem, right? Because as soon as you notice that you fix it, <laughs> right? Like say, oh, that only means that I existed then. Maybe I don't exist now, but then you can run the argument again. Well, but if I thought I exist now, then I, well, I existed, existed when I thought that, <laughs> right? So it's a weird problem, but it is a potential problem. And it's, um, it's related to what various people in a way Kant's, well, I mean, I guess not just in a way. Uh, Kant maybe is the is the prime example of someone who who finds a problem in this respect. And the the the, the problem is the conclusion from the accident, I think, to the existence of a substance, the mind. Right, remember what Aristotle, remember that at least one of the uses Aristotle had for substance is that it's a continuing substrate in which the accidents change. So, I mean, for this argument to prove that I exist, the I am here has to like refer to the subject of the I think, which still exists now. And so you can make this, you, you could make this work by, by saying something like, whatever thinks must be a substance. But then you have to ask, well, but where does that come from? And Kant is going to say, well, it comes from transcendental illusion. <laughs> Um, but uh, oh, that actually, that's, I mean, that's only one of Kant's, there, there, there's also Kant's version of how to do it right, which is the transcendental deduction. So, if, um, which, which, which also works with the fact that, that I must have an identity across different times. Um, so anyway, if you want to find out more about that, you can take 106 next quarter. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, but Kant isn't the only one, like Nietzsche basically makes an objection like that to Descartes. And, um, so, so that's an issue and I wanna, and I think Descartes has something to say about it, but it's, um, um, but it's definitely worth pointing out as a, a, as a potential problem. Um, Um, as to why there's two <laughs> cogito arguments rather than just one. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm basically just going through a bunch of somewhat disconnected things about this argument. <laughs> um, so, um, so as for why there's two rather than just one, um, I'm not sure about this, but, um, but I feel like there's there were two important aspects to the meditator's state before they reached this conclusion. And it's kind of like put together, they constitute doubt. So one aspect was the lack of certainty. And you might think that that counts as doubt by itself. But I think to really count as doubt, you have to add another part, which is wanting certainty, <laughs> right? The will to certainty. And so, I mean, I'm pretty sure that those there's those two aspects there. Uh, what I'm less sure about is whether they somehow match up with these two versions of the argument. Um, I mean, the second one about the deceiver, 
definitely the way the deceiver comes up at the end of the first meditation is in terms of the um, um, power of my will, right? Um, I shall stubbornly and firmly persist in this meditation. And even if it is not in my power to know any truth, I shall at least do what is in my power. Now, how does the meditator know that is in their power? But I shall at least do what is in my power. I mean, I think Spinoza is going to say, that's not in your power. And then the question is going to be whether Spinoza is, is relating to this on the right level. But anyway, so I shall at least do what is in my power, that is resolutely guard against assenting to any falsehood so that the deceiver, however powerful and cunning he may be, will be unable to impose on me in the slightest degree. Um, so that seems like it corresponds to the will to certainty, right? So that is thinking, try as as he might. The deceiver can never deceive me about this, um, is a way of saying that, that the thing that had that will to certainty exists. Um, what I'm less sure is about whether the thing about if I persuaded my, myself of something can be split off from that. And that's more about the lack of certainty. I don't know. I mean, that's because that's also that persuaded myself is also has to do with that direction of the will, that like flipping of the will that happens at the end of the first meditation. So maybe they're really both about that. Um, oh, I didn't notice there was a question in the chat. Yeah, I think I addressed this before. Right, someone asked in the chat, I guess a long time ago, wait, is the argument that you can't deceive someone who doesn't exist, that they exist true because you can't interact with a non-existent person? That's, yeah, that's what the argument is supposed to be, right? You can't deceive a non-existent person. Um, no matter how powerful and clever you are, you can't deceive a non-existent person. <laughs> um, um okay so there's i guess one last thing i want to say but it's connected to the passage i was just reading which is about um is there a presupposition to this argument does it have a secret premise or something like that um i mean uh It's a very weird kind of argument. You kind of seem to get something for nothing. It, it has that in, I mean, uh, it has that in common with the ontological proof of the existence of God, which we'll talk about later. But um, in that case, I think almost everyone who reads the ontological proof thinks somehow I'm being tripped by this. Something has gone wrong. This is a lot harder to say that about. It seems kind of convincing. <laughs> um, but at the same time, you have a suspicion something has been smuggled in. So, I mean, I suggested one thing that could, could have been smuggled in, something about substance about think, a thinking thing being a substance or something like that. Um, um, but uh, there may also be another type of, not assumption, but presupposition here. And, um, and so coming back to this, I shall at least do what is in my power and asking, how do I know that's in my power? Um, uh, 
So the presupposition here possibly is a practical presupposition. That is, it's the presupposition that I should do something. So, you know, that is in, in the last part, the meditator feels that she's going to wake up um, to hard labor in the dark, in a prison. Um, which, I mean, all of those things deserve thought. Why it's a prison, why it's hard labor, why it's in the dark. But I think uh, the main thing I want to call attention to right now is that, um, and it's, that's the thing that Thoreau is commenting on and, and offering a contrast to in the, in the passage I read last time that the meditator wakes up to a task. Right, the meditator wakes up to a kind of command. It's not clear where it comes from exactly, but the command is um, to seek certainty. It's the most important thing in the world. <laughs> don't, be, don't let yourself be deceived. Um, and, you know, there's a famous form of argument from Kant, this often summarized this way, ought implies can, <laughs> right? That is, you can't be commanded to do something you can't do. So if you recognize a command, that means you're, um, you've already acknowledged that you're able to do it. Sorry, can you not read this? It says ought implies can. Maybe I should have written it higher up. Like the camera in the way of the board. That's, that's an idea from Kant. It's, I, it's, so it's an idea from Kant, but I'm saying it looks like it's here in Descartes, right? Implicitly. How do I know that I have the power to receive to to uh, resist this deceiver, well, I know because uh, I'm uh, I have a task of reaching certainty. <laughs> um, so, so you know, so what that means is that I don't like I don't know in a theoretical, I can't prove it. I can't prove that it's true, but it's a necessary practical assumption. When I'm deliberating about what I should do, I have to assume this. Yeah. Is this, is this maybe related to like how in the second meditation there seems to be this constant refrain of like, what is this I? Like every paragraph he just keeps asking, okay, so what, what am I? What did I think I was? What is this I? He just keeps moving forwards and forwards with this, uh, this problem of the I. Well, I think, I don't know. Well, I mean, I mean it, it, it is related to that, but I think it's related to the content he ends up finding, like the answer he ends up finding. Yes. Okay, and that's the next thing I'm going to talk about. But uh, so, um, so I'm basically, at this point, in a somewhat disorganized way, finished talking about the Cogito argument. <laughs> Are there questions? And now I'm going to go on to the, to the following passage, where the following passage is the one that begins... Um, um, oops, that's the first meditation. But I do not yet have a sufficient understanding of what this I is that now necessarily exists. Right? That's where that's where the part you're talking about starts. Yeah. Uh, before we move on. Yeah. Um, do you think? I mean, obviously. Um, in the next part, the rational animal part is related to Aristotle. But in this um, uh, this argument, do you think that there's the idea of like how you define yourself without accidents in this? Like once you take away, uh, what is it? 
no shape, body shape, extension, movement, and place are uh, chimeras. Do you think that that is directly referencing um, Aristotle? Uh, well, um, so the, the definition of body that he ends up giving uh, definitely agrees with Aristotle, among others, about what body is. Um, in that sense, it's related to Aristotle. Uh, um, but um, but it's not so so like spoiler alert. <laughs> Descartes is a substance dualist, mm. right? So he thinks there's two substances. One is the body. And the other is the soul or mind, right? Mm. So, and there's some relationship between them, which is hard to understand, but each one is a substance and can exist on its own. So he's, I mean, what he's doing there is um, not so much uh, separating himself, I mean, He's, he's starting, he won't be finished till the sixth meditation, but he's starting to do the same kind of thing that Avicenna is trying to do to, to show that um, if the body is a substance, the mind is not the same substance. Um, I mean, the mind and the body have accidents or modes, as Descartes will call them, right? That are so like there's different thoughts at different times in my mind. Mm -hmm. And you know, and yeah, the body has shape and which can change. It can change its shape, etc. Right. So so they both have accidents, but what he's doing here is not distinguishing a substance from its accidents, but really like beginning the project of distinguishing one substance from another. Um, and I, since I mentioned this, I will say that that although Descartes is close to Avicenna, um, and so Avicenna thinks Avicenna actually thinks that even souls of animals and plants are substances. Uh, Thomas would uh, disagree with that, actually. but but certainly the the human soul is a substance and it's an immaterial substance or at least part of it is the intellectual soul um, but what avicenna doesn't agree with is that the human body could exist on its own without the soul <laughs> that's that that's what in other words in context the the radical feature of descartes dualism is going to be to say that the body is a separate substance <laughs> Not the part about saying the mind is a separate or separable substance, because lots of people said that. <laughs> right? That makes the body, the body becomes uh, like its own little mechanism that can go on on its own without a mind. All right. Um, but back to the second meditation, or I mean, back to the first part of the second meditation. Um, okay, right. So um, well, this is where I was going to talk about the dream of the computer program. I finally saw it. All right, good enough. So, right. So the immediate problem is, um, okay, I exist. What, what am I? And I mean, again, this is like, this is a reason to be really suspicious about this argument. How can you prove something exists before you know what it is? <laughs> like if I said, okay, I have a proof that there's a boogle next door, like behind that wall, there's a boogle. <laughs> and you're like, what's a boogle? And I'm like, I don't know, but I have a proof that there's one behind that wall, right? You know, so that doesn't seem to make any sense. <laughs> well, if we can prove that there's something behind that wall, right? Because, well, but like, 
if I say there must be something behind that wall, or I cannot conceive of the absence of anything, and I shall name that thing Google. Right. Bada bing, that's proof. Now, now Google might be a hallway and it yeah. might be another classroom and it might be a rhinoceros, but it exists. <laughs> so yeah, that's actually that that's actually a good point. So what I should have said is I have a demonstration that a bugle exists. Because when I said it's behind that wall, I already said, I, I, I said, I do know something about it. It's behind that wall. <laughs> right. So, but we don't have something like that here, apparently. It just proves that something exists. I mean, that's going to be the answer in the end, but it's but like we have to try to figure out what that means. Yeah. What would he say to the claim that all other thoughts besides ones that arise from the manifestation of our awareness of our thoughts are thoughts themselves? All other thoughts arise from sensory details of some sort of sensibility outside of the rationality that builds up the rationality. He's he's going to talk about that in the second part of the second the the next part of the second meditation. Also, what would you say about animals then? Because animals definitely think they they might not be rational, but they definitely do have thoughts in ourselves. Well, uh, so Descartes is is famous actually for having maintained that non-human animals are automaton. Although it seems like he's not always completely sure about that. But anyway, that you know, he at least favored that view. Yeah. Um, but uh, when we get to Spinoza and Leibniz, we'll we'll, we'll see how they try to. Um, Actually, they both go the other direction and say that in a way everything thinks, even the simplest things. <laughs> in a way, everything is what well. everything thinks right. in some in some way. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think for good reasons, but anyway, yeah. But uh, Spinoza and Leibniz have better reasons. All right. Anyway. <laughs> um, So, um, right, so, so the, the, the general conclusion, I mean, the general method is going to be, and this is a general rationalist method, where you say, um, well, and actually Avicenna was already using it in the floating man argument, he uses it in other places too. If I can think about A, um, I should write it. Without thinking about B, then A and B are distinct. Or maybe you should say, if I can if I can believe in A without believing in B, or if I can know about A without knowing about B. <laughs> I'm not sure what the best way to put this principle is, but uh, or if I I can if I can think A without thinking B, <laughs> then A and B are distinct. And so I mean. Um, this is like this is one of the main ways. You know, so again, rationalists think that we can tell what the world is like by thinking, <laughs> by reason. How could that be? Well, this is one of the main techniques, right? You learn something about the world by what you can think it. Um. So. Uh, um. And how can you justify that? Why would you say this? Well, I mean, it's basically because um, if you can think about A without thinking about B, then B wasn't what you were thinking about. <laughs> um, you can't, so to speak, miss what you were thinking about. And hit something else instead. Yeah. Uh, what exactly does this thing mean? Uh, what is 
I mean, like, I get that being separate, but like, like, is there any like further like clarification that can be provided? Well, so so like the way Descartes is going to understand this is that uh, at least an omnipotent being could cause A to exist without B. So, I mean, that principle isn't like available in its full force this early. That's what he's going to, you know, he's going to use it in the sixth meditation to prove that the mind is not the body and vice versa. Um, um, but he's still, he's already kind of using part of it here or getting ready to use it, maybe I should say, by noticing that, and again, this is this is something that he plausibly, you know, found in Avicenna. Um, noticing that uh, there's something myself that I can't believe doesn't exist, even though I've persuaded myself that there are no bodies and no right. So, and in particular, that there's no, that what I used to call my body doesn't exist. So I've persuaded myself that what I used to call my body doesn't exist. So I'm thinking about something and what I'm thinking about is not my body. <laughs> At least in the sense that, this, in the end, the conclusion is gonna be, in the sixth meditation, the conclusion is gonna be, what I'm thinking about is not my body. Therefore, it's something distinct from my body that could exist without my body. At this point, the conclusion is just going to be what I'm thinking about is not my body. So, um, although it might also be by be my body for all I know, that's not um, how like what I know about it. Right. This is at. Um, um, Page 83, I think. Mm -hmm. Right, did I write down what this is? Oh yeah, okay. Bottom of page 81 and top of eight. Yeah, okay. Right, actually, so it's on page 82 here. And yet may it not perhaps be the case that these very things which I am supposing to be nothing, because they are unknown to me, are in reality identical with the eye of which I am aware. Maybe I should start a little bit further back. I am not that structure of limbs which is called a human body. For these, I am not even a thin vapor which permeates the limbs, a wind, fire, air, breath, or whatever I depict in my imagination. For these are things which I have supposed to be nothing, right? All bodies he's supposed not to exist. Let this supposition stand. For all that, I am still something, right? So, um, right, so what he's saying is, I may, I'm doubting that all bodies exist, but I'm sure still I'm still certain that I am something. Therefore, what I'm I'm not thinking of myself as a body. I'm thinking of myself in some other way. It's some other property of myself that I'm using to pick myself out because um, if I were thinking of myself of a body, I would be able to doubt that I exist because I'm doubting that all bodies exist. Um, but then the next sentence is, and yet may it not perhaps be the case that these very things which I am supposing to be nothing, because they are unknown to me, are in reality identical with the eye of which I'm aware. 
right? So in other words, okay, I'm not thinking about myself as a body, but so so that means I'm I have some property other than being a body. Right, that is the, the way, the thing, the description under which I know I exist is not as a body. But nevertheless, maybe I'm also a body. <laughs> and the answer is, I do not know. And for the moment, I shall not argue the point. So, as I said, at this point, he's setting up for this argument. He's saying, okay, well, when I think of myself, I'm not thinking of a body. But then, um, and I mean, again, I'm, I've been slipping back into saying Descartes says, Descartes says, but it's the meditator, right? And this is like a, a perfect example of why it's important to keep that in mind. Descartes, of course, already knows that what he thinks about the mind of the body when he writes this passage, right? So he knows perfectly well what he's going to do with this later in the sixth meditation. But the meditator puts it off for later because they're not ready at this stage. Um, oh boy, I only have five minutes left. Um, okay, so... Um, so the answer, right? So no, let's just do it. right. So that that is the part of the reading today that follows the cogito argument itself is the part that that tries to answer and does answer this question: What am I? And there's like three answers that are tried. The first, an first answer is rational animal. And obviously, yeah, that's the Aristotelian answer. That gets dismissed very quickly. Not as false, but as um, too hard to look into at this point. Then I should have to inquire what an animal is, what rationality is. And in this way, one question will lead me down the slope to other harder ones. And I do not now have time to waste on subtleties of this kind. Um, if I had more time, I would, spend, <laughs> I would spend some time asking why there's such a hurry. <laughs> okay. But in any case, right, so rational animal is ruled out quickly. The second one is that I am a body. And that's not really the Aristotelian answer, right? I mean, the meditator describes this as the first thought to come to mind. I think it's supposed to be a kind of pre-philosophical uh thought about what about what i am right so the first one was like what i'd been taught to say in the schools right you know this, so that, that was the first answer i gave that was like an artificial answer and descartes is like do you really understand that maybe not <laughs> what would you have said before you heard that you, you studied all that aristotelian philosophy right so so now the meditator is like yeah, okay, so this is the thought that comes first to mind, that I had a face, hands, arms, and the whole mechanical structure of limbs, which can be seen in a corpse, and which I called the body. The next thought was that I was nourished, that I moved about, right? So I'm not just a corpse. <laughs> um, I don't just have limbs with a certain shape or whatever. Something's going on. I'm nourished. Uh, um, I have sense perception and thinking. And these actions I attributed to the soul. So I thought I was a body with a soul. But then when I asked what the soul was, the first thought that came to my mind was um, that it was also some kind of body, only much thinner. <laughs> 
right? As to the nature of this soul, either I did not think about this or else I imagined it to be something tenuous, like a wind or fire or ether, which permeated my more solid parts. So like the full version of this is that I'm kind of two kinds of body put together, right? Like I'm a big, I guess I shouldn't be drawing down here, should I? Every time I try down there, people go, <laughs> let me put it over here. All right, so we ruled this out because we don't know what it means. We don't have time to figure out what it means. <laughs> this one, so it really turns out to mean that I'm kind of like this mechanical body, but then in order to explain why it doesn't act like an inanimate thing, we say there must be something else here, call that the soul. But then when we ask what the soul is, again, all we can imagine is that it's some other kind of body that's kind of like permeates this one. Now, I mean, uh, whether that's a pre-philosophical view of the soul or not, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, it's definitely a, a view of the soul that was maintained by certain ancient schools, right? Like this was the Stoics and Epicureans said about the soul. Um, and moreover, uh, although Aristotle doesn't think that about the soul, he thinks there also is that, <laughs> right? That is, there's that that there is this very thin fluid that's that moves through the body, and it's by means of that that the soul controls the body or something like that. Um, and sure enough, Descartes is also going to believe in that, right? This is called animal spirits. A big part of Descartes' explanation of how the brain and the nerves work is going to be that the, this fluid is, is you know, traveling through them. Well, I, I mean, it's true in a way. There is a fluid, sort of. <laughs> Ions, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually just everything's much smaller and much more complicated than, than they thought. <laughs> it's, not, it's not entirely wrong about that. But anyway, so, um, but obviously this answer is not going to get us very far because, and that's right, it's, that's the passage I was just reading where he says, well, no, I can't have proved that this exists. Because this whole argument occurred in the, against the background of denying that there are any bodies. And nothing here served to show that there were after all. Right? That's not how it worked. The way it worked was I said, I have persuaded myself that there are no bodies. What follows from that? Does it follow that I don't exist? No, on the contrary. If I persuaded myself of something, I certainly exist. Right, so that didn't cast any that that didn't uh, somehow interfere with the original persuasion that there are no bodies. It just said that that doesn't show you that you don't exist. It shows you that bodies don't exist. So that means you, but that also means that you haven't proved that a body exists. And that again is the content of the passage that I just read to you. Um. Actually, to make it clear, the meditator brings the powerful deceiver back in and says, um, couldn't the deceiver make me think that there's such a thing as this when there isn't? Why not? Right? There's no answer to that. So this answer is out. So what is it? What do we know about this thing? And as I was saying before, the clue that the meditator uses in the end, the only thing we know about this thing is that 
It was doubt. Right? That's what we know about it. We know that it was doubting. Um, perhaps you should say, and we knew that eventually it overcame the doubts. So here's the it, here's where the answer is given on page eighty three. But what then am I? A thing that thinks, right? So the answer is race cogitans, right? This part means thing, and this means, means thinking. A thinking thing. This is the genus, and this is the differentia. Um, so uh, a thing that thinks, what is that? A thing that doubts, understands, affirms, denies, is willing, is unwilling, and also imagines and has sensory perceptions. Where does that list come from? You can tell from the next paragraph. This is a considerable list if everything on it belongs to me. But does it? Is it not one and the same I who is now doubting almost everything, who nonetheless understands some things, who affirms that this one thing is true, denies everything else, desires to know more, is unwilling to be deceived, imagines many things even involuntarily? Right? The whole list comes from the argument. <laughs> that's that's the only source of information about what I am. Yeah. When he says he's a thing that thinks, does that mean that there's a thing before the thought in that case, like a pre pre cogito or something like that? Well, this is a, I mean, this is the pri priority of the genus to the species is a logical priority, not a necessarily a temporal oh. priority, but. Um, but that's not to say that that question is bad, but it has to be reframed somehow. Um, and I just realized I'm over, I've gone over by seven minutes. I'm sorry. Um, so I will see you next week. Bye. Bye.